Hi, welcome to another edition of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space podcast. The Global Network was created in 1992 to prevent the arms race from moving into space. You can support the show by clicking on the like button and also subscribing to our YouTube channel. And also check out our website at spaceforpeace.org. We thank our Global Network board member, Will Griffin, for doing the tech work to make this show possible. Our guest this time is Joan Roloffs from New Hampshire, who's an author of a very interesting new book entitled The Trillion Dollar Silencer. Why is there so much, why is there so little anti-war protest in the U.S.? So welcome to the show, Joan. Uh, take a moment and briefly introduce yourself, please. Well, I'm a retired professor of political science at Keene State College. I still teach in a senior citizen program, the Cheshire Academy for Lifelong Learning. And I have taught courses there in, in the military industrial complex and the CIA and many, many other things. Uh, most of the people there are retired professionals or business people. I, I'm the author of five books, in addition to the new one. Uh, there, I wrote a book on foundations and public policy, a book on greening cities, and uh, two translations from French, including one of Charles Fourier's anti-war fantasy called the World War of Small Pastries. And I've been an anti-war activist since the Korean War. I'm that old. <laughs> well, you, you have a good lineage then. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Uh, Joan is going to take uh, about 15 minutes and do a PowerPoint presentation. And then after that, uh, I'll come back on and we'll uh, have a question and answer a time for the rest of the show. So go ahead, Joan. Okay. Well, I wrote my book, which actually was a series of articles that became a book starting around 2006. In order to discover why there's so little anti-war protest, especially by progressives, libertarians, environmentalists, civil rights advocates, academics, clergy, community volunteers, artists, retired people, and others who might be expected to be not only concerned, but alarmed at the state of the world today and the role of the U.S. military. I concluded that there were four major reasons, and there may be more. One is propaganda, along with the silence in the mainstream media. The second is fear, fear of offending or retaliation from friends, relatives, the community, one's customers, donors, or employers. Another is distractions, which include entertainment, hobbies, drugs, family and health crises, and even worthy participation in other causes. And the fourth is interests. And my book is mostly about the interests because I felt that the anti-war movement has not paid enough attention to this subject and it needs a lot more visibility. And I am hoping very much that more people will investigate and publicize the vast extent of militarization of our economy and culture, and then seeing what we're up against, try to figure out how to change things. That is the big puzzle. How can we change things? I will show a visual summary of what I'm up to in a map that I made for my state, New Hampshire. And I have on my website suggestions for anyone who wants to make a map for another state or a city or a country for that matter. Okay, this is an interactive map, so it can be expanded. And uh, you can click on each icon to see what it represents. 
National Guard Armory Plymouth, or you can click on a point there. Uh, find this a JROTC program in a high school in Rochester, New Hampshire. I'll make it smaller so you can get an idea of what this state is looks like. And it's it's pretty it's pretty intense, including in in rural areas, some connection to the military. And my my website is w w dot joan roloff's one word dot wordpress dot com. Among the interests that have caused silence is, of course, the military establishment itself, which is uh, frequently under publicized. The Department of Defense is the largest department in the federal government, and it works cooperatively with most of the other departments, especially, for example, interior. There's a concern for so much of the space in the United States that the military occupies. Homeland Security, Veterans Affairs, Energy, which oversees nuclear weapon production. The State Department provides training for all foreign militaries that purchase weapons from the United States. And even the Department of Agriculture gets into the act uh, because it worked with the military to try to create a cattle dairy industry in Afghanistan. Defense also collaborates with agencies such as the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Institutes of Health, and the AID, Agency for International Development. And, and here's a map that shows just some of the lands that the military occupies. Yes, this is the test and training land put out by the Department of Defense some years ago, includes, of course, uh, areas in the sea. And those are, that's just part of the place that is occupied by the U.S. military in this, in this country. The Defense Department also includes institutes, academies, university-based programs in the U.S. and overseas. The instructors are not only military people, but also politicians and other civilians. Universities have ROTC programs, and uh, in high schools, the junior ROTC. There are public schools that are military academies, and Chicago has several of these. Parents choose to send their children there because they, it has much better funding than the regular public schools. And many of those children do not go into the military, but they're all exposed to the propaganda of the instructors. And Washington State has a quasi-military high school for at-risk youths. The Defense Department has an office to uh, assist in the production of Hollywood films. And there's another office that provides flyovers for your event provided they approve of your mission. Military bases are the economic hub of their regions, and some are the size of small cities. All the businesses near the bases provide food, entertainment, housing, shopping, car rentals. Even museums and cultural features benefit from these bases. And... Um, there's huge contracts for construction companies, information technology installation, facilities upgrading, environmental remediation, guard duty, and more. Civilian workers find a lot of jobs there. And the Defense Department spends billions for intelligence, logistics, and transportation. The U.S. military is the largest consumer of fuel in the world. And surprised me to find out that Humana, which is a private health insurance company, was among the top 10 defense contractors in 2020. 
And contracts are um, awarded to all sizes and types of businesses, not only weapons makers. Subcontracts for weapons parts support a lot of civilian industries and it helps our outsourced economy to plod along. In my city, a manufacturer of wooden children's furniture received a contract to make cribs for army base childcare centers because new safety standards required the replacement of the existing cribs. The federal government requires that all departments buy new USA made products unless they're completely unavailable. This gives many declining industries threatened by outsourcing a new lease on life. Sports bras for the military, unlike almost all other bras, are produced in the United States. The Defense Department has major contracts with many non-governmental organizations, including environmental and charitable ones. And one of its programs, the Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration, creates buffer zones around bombing ranges. It aims to reduce civilian encroachment near live fire exercise war games areas. And the Nature Conservancy is a major contractor in this program, probably billions in contracts. But also involved are Evergreen State College, Ducks Unlimited, Oregon Zoo, Maine Audubon Society, and Trout Unlimited. And uh, here's a map to show where some of these programs have occurred. This also gives you an idea of the major bases. Some of the major US military bases. And uh, there is a project in Maine for the, um, the Navy survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. And it's in the mountains and it requires tremendous amount of wilderness. There can't be any uh, civilian businesses, including uh, ski lodges, ski places uh, that would conflict with it. So that's something to, to look up if you're in Maine. And also, um, uh, very large contracts go to Goodwill Industries, Lighthouse for the Blind, and other other firms that employ disabled persons, or ha and they have contracts for janitorial services, furniture, clothing, and landscaping. There are uh, university programs, research institutes, and think tanks. Uh, and that includes religious studies get contracts because uh, DARPA found out that religious people object to warfare using robots and cyborgs. So they have actually given contracts to scholars of religious studies to find out how to counter this terrible prejudice, which is not only in the United States, but around the world amongst religious people. Uh, the Defense Department in uh, this year funded a $90 million research center at Howard University. And this is for research for the Air Force to develop tactical autonomy warfare. That's the use of autonomous agents in warfare. And the Defense Department has its own philanthropy. It donates surplus equipment to the Red Cross, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and others. And it also disposes of surplus equipment to state governments. And one example is the armored bear cat, um, which is now owned by the police in my city and other, other places, many places in the country. That is what they have in Keene, New Hampshire. This isn't the Keene one though. The private contractors also, especially the weapons makers, are very philanthropic. And they're particularly generous with minority and youth organizations, such as the Congressional Black Caucus, the American Indian College Fund, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. 
and they're major donors to all the arts and supporters of women's organizations. But the contractors don't just give cash grants. They fund joint programs, scholarships, and internships. They send tutors and mentors to public schools, and they sponsor STEM education programs, including the very popular robotics competitions in public schools. And uh, you may know people who have children in these programs, so you can't complain, but they are they are sponsored by uh, Lockheed and Raytheon and uh, all the major contractors. And the, um, the, the people who come from those companies wear T-shirts with the logo so the children are sure to remember them favorably. And uh, also, of course, non-governmental organizations have investments in all of the military companies. And that's true of union pension funds and state government pension funds, very heavily uh, invested in military companies. States have military departments and National Guard units, um, huge subsidies to get businesses, to, uh, to get contracts with the military, and uh, state environmental departments work with the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense to clean up the terrible Superfund sites, and Hanford is the site of the nuclear reactor that produced the material for the first atomic test. It's considered the most contaminated area in the United States. Billions have been spent trying to clean this up, and it may never be cleaned up, but in the meantime, there are jobs. And Hanford is a shining rock of prosperity for its area. Here's a here's what's going on at Hanford for years and years and years, and it will probably never be cleaned up. And uh, in addition, uh, recreation is also part of the military industrial complex. Both the Army Corps of Engineers, which produces uh, lakes for civilians and parks, and also military bases themselves offer hunting, fishing, kayaking, camping, and bouncy castles. Some military bases will only offer this uh, to people with a military connection, others for anyone with the appropriate sponsorship. And uh, one of the tourist selections in this country is the um, Manhattan Project National Historic Park. And you can, you can go there for a vacation, you can take your children there, and um, the children may receive a junior ranger badge after their visit. So no doubt the military uh, does some useful things, but at the cost of silencing millions, these useful things could be done by civilian agencies. And the problem is how to get the change. And that I hope other people are going to be thinking about. <laughs> okay. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, that prompts several questions. Uh, the first one, let me ask you this. How do you think things have changed during your career as you look back on the Korean War, the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and the way the American people responded to those wars, particularly the peace movement? How has that changed from those days to where we are today? What would you say about that? Well, I, I would say there was there is a considerable change. One of the most obvious things is the lack of participation from religious organizations in this country. Uh, because in those days, they they got uh, they, the peace movement got a certain amount of respectability because. Uh, so many of the religious leaders were part of it, including, of course, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who was an anti-war advocate, uh, but also the Catholic bishops and, you know, Catholic, various Catholic organizations, uh, Jewish organizations, uh, 
that has that has changed tremendously. But one of the causes I think is related to what I was working on in, earlier for many years, which is the role of foundations in uh, funding social change organizations and a whole process which broke up the uh, movements of the 60s, which were opposed to war, to capitalism, to imperialism, and transformed that scene into a lot of small organizations that had a single issue and identity politics. And uh, how that worked out, I've described in great detail in my book on foundations. And that has certainly continued. It's so that um, that's one kind of distraction people have. A lot of these causes are fine. They're wonderful causes, but um, it it takes away from the larger picture. Of course, the end of the draft certainly had something to do with it. But I know that I was part of the peace movement at the time of the Vietnam War, and I wasn't worried about the draft. I was teaching at NYU at the time, and many of my colleagues, professors, they weren't protesting because of fear of the draft, and even our children were too young to be drafted. So that was part, certainly part of it, and it would help if all the people in Congress's children were drafted. But um, but there was so much else that people saw, uh, and partly because you know the role of television began to be significant. So you could you could see what was going on in the world. And um, I know what you uh, what you say about uh, foundations is true. Years ago, um, we used to have what we called a disarmament movement in this country. Yes. And it came to especially nuclear weapons. It was very strong. Uh, but then one of the major foundations in the country sent out a memo to its <clears throat> potential funders saying that they could no longer use the word disarmament any longer. They had to use the words arms control yeah. if they hoped to get any money. Yeah. This was really an indication, I I believe, that the Democratic Party, who was you know relatively close, to, if you if uh, you could say, to the peace movement, was feeling too much pressure, and they wanted to have a cozy relationship with these weapons corporations. And so, by changing the theme from disarmament to arms control, mm-hmm. making some number of weapons acceptable. Uh, this became uh, a requirement if you wanted to get money. Uh, let's talk more about fear. I, I wrote a blog post today where I mentioned fear. That I, I, For the last 16 months, I stand on a street corner, sometimes alone, sometimes with a couple other people with a sign saying uh, no war with Russia or uh, no more money for Ukraine, uh, 160 billion so far, uh, but uh, I I really see it in the faces of the people driving by. Uh, they're afraid to even look. They're afraid to show any expression. They're afraid to show any opinion. Could you talk more about this fear that seems to have gripped uh, so many of the people in our country and what the origins of that fear are? Go deeper into that, if you would. Well, yes. One one of the I think one of the really important things is economic. Because of the outsourcing of so much civilian industry, so many people now are dependent on jobs associated with the military, not just weapons, but all kinds of industries now. And um, and people don't want to lose their jobs. Um, this outsourcing was not just because of greedy corporations. It was a a project of the Cold War to build up um, a a capitalist industry in Southeast Asia, for example. And uh, at the cost of 
civilian industries in this country. And so a lot of people are um, employed in, in jobs that connected with the military right now. And of course they're afraid, but it also <clears throat> like the, um, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Like the um, the robotics competitions, I don't want to offend my friend whose children are in it. You know, I I don't want to say anything bad about the military or uh, say, you know, do you know that's funded by Raytheon or BAE? No, so. Um, and and a lot of people have relatives who have uh, who are war heroes, um, and and you you know it's it's or who work in local charities. A lot of fear because <clears throat> they should be afraid of nuclear war, <laughs> but. Uh, they don't think about that. In a sense, the way I feel about it is that many people are giving up their authority mm -hmm. uh, as a citizen, as a public citizen, yeah. uh, when they refuse to speak out or they're afraid to speak out. Uh, and it's going to have an impact on their children, their grandchildren in the years ahead. And they seem to, in this capitalist country that we live in, materialist country that we live in, they seem to value those things even more than the Native American call to protect the next seven generations. Okay. For me, that's very frightening. Uh, let's talk briefly, because we're getting short on time, about what do we do to get out from behind this eight ball? Yeah. You know, money drives the military industrial complex, the quest for global domination, uh, as you described it, setting up capitalist enterprises around the world. Uh, this drives a lot of our foreign policy, our military policy. Uh, what's your sense about how we get out from behind this eight ball today? <laughs> well, it also is, uh, there's a need to prop up this country's economy too. And that's a another thing that the military industrial complex is doing they're propping up because you know they don't want capitalism to fail here although if you look around at the misery in so many places um you might say it's it's doing pretty badly but it keep it keeps up a little bit of the economy and and that's part of it too uh how to get out of it i don't know i i think more people have to Think about that. <laughs> Try to figure it out. <laughs> I have the questions. I don't have the answers. All right. Well, Joan, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you being on the show. Uh, we're also going to run your article that you wrote in our yes. newspaper, uh, Space Alert, that uh, will be going to the printer very soon. I'll send you a copy. I'll send you a few extra copies as well, actually. Uh, so thanks again. Okay. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're welcome. And thank you for watching another edition of Space Alert. We'll do another show next month with a movement leader from a different part of the world. Until then, good luck to you all, and please get organized.